Welcome to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of wonderful people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So there's never been a time where we've spent so much time in our homes. So in today's episode, I'm talking with Cecilia about creating calm, beautiful households through a blend of permaculture design, Zen living and Japanese culture. In her words, helping people live lightly and delightly. So welcome, Cecilia. It's wonderful to be here, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, please. So let me tell you a little bit about Cecilia. So Cecilia's mission is turning regular people, regular people into designers who make good places to live with whatever resources they have. She lives in Melbourne, where she creates home wellness retreats, does hands-on decluttering, and trains her students to become declutter designers, bringing her message and method to brighten dark corners and lighten people's loads. Cecilia has 28 years experience in permaculture design, 20 of seven of which were living in Japan. She worked on, design, on the design of self-maintaining garden for Sir Richard Branson's Caribbean Island. She was in, engaged as a consultant for Taronga Zoo's 10 year plan. Cecilia is the co-author of Visual Language for Global Communication together with the legendary user interface designer, Aaron Marcus, and has spoken at high profile events such as Vivid Ideas Sydney. So a dose of Cecilia's positive action oriented energy is truly what we all need right now. So let's begin. Let's begin. Let's begin. So before we get on to how you wonderfully design and help people recreate spaces, let's go a little bit backwards because your background is in permaculture design and you obviously have an influence from a lot of the Japanese culture having lived there for 27 years. So for those that might be listening that don't really know what permaculture design even is, can you just give us a little rundown of what is permaculture design? Oh, there's a whole blog post on definitions of what permaculture is, like a whole article. And there's every definition you could think of. For me, when I first read about permaculture, I thought, wow, this is a way I can live my life so I don't exploit anybody or creature and no one exploits me. Most people think that it's a kind of organic gardening, but no, 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 that's not at all right. So when Bill Mollison, back in the forests of Tasmania, um, was actually living in the forest, he looked around and thought, we could design cities like this forest. In the forest, every creature only does the work it wants to do and it's good at. The rabbits dig, the birds fly, and there's no waste and there's no police people. There's full employment and lots of rest. Why can't we design cities like that? And he thought, what are the principles operating in this forest that we could be using? And he wrote them all down, tried them out. So it's a collection of little principles like increase useful diversity and reduce useless diversity that will create stable, beautiful systems where things are diverse and ticking over and everything's having its best life. So how do we do that in cities? And we as individuals have a lot more power than we think especially when we team up with other individuals like Lisa and Cecilia and get good stuff out into the world. So, so Bill started these two week design courses after trying to create edible ecosystems. So an edible ecosystem is not a farm. In an edible ecosystem, you kind of throw a party and all the animals and creatures and plants come to this party and make things that are useful for people. So you might say, hmm, this land, the wind blows cold and hard. Let's have a, let's um, 
have a income where we dry fruit in this cold, dry air. And you invite your other friends who are growing things and you dry the fruit for them. So whatever resource you've got, you think, how can I use this well? Yeah, you don't you. complain and say, poor me, I want to be a, a papaya farmer and it's so cold and windy. No, you make the most of what you've got. Yeah, amazing. So basically what you're saying is that we design solutions considering our, no, our natural local resources that we have. Yes, and a lot of even permaculturalists forget that includes your personality resources. And you don't get to say, well, you know, I'd love to make a contribution, but I'm so shy and I'm not very clever. That's okay. There's still heaps you can do being shy or heaps you can do being not very clever or way too clever. There's, there's no personality that doesn't have a really important role. So I am naturally very messy. Ooh. And that's why I'm a really powerful declutterer because I don't go into someone's house saying, let's start lining things up and let's get a bit of order here. No, I, I understand where they're coming from. So most of my clients are naturally very messy and creative and I really care about them, which is why I, I do this. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is that, you know, these permaculture designs that were originally, um, I suppose, brought about in looking in nature, um, and then got put into how do we how do we do that and design cities in that way you've taken that to a step further and looked at it all right so let's just take these principles and how do we apply them to people's lives in their homes for their spaces as well as in working together with community so you're looking at well you know how do we, how do we take what a person has um, with the self not with the, their own self knowledge and knowledge um, you know, so that they're aware of themselves and how do we then apply that to them being part of the solution, the collective solution? That's right. That's right. And most permaculture designers use permaculture to design edible gardens or farms. And I did that too. And I still do. And I love it. Start at the back door, make a really small, edible, useful, loved place, expand it. But I very quickly realized that the people who did who really succeeded with their balconies they also had great kitchen sinks so lisa i'm a funny lady in my travels around the world whenever i'd spy a really cool balcony garden because i was really into balcony edible balconies i'd knock on the door and say hello i'm cecilia i'm a permaculture designer you are doing great can i have a photo and i'd interview them and just find out why they're succeeding because um, as you know, the best way to learn how to be healthy is find out what healthy people are doing and, mm -hmm. and do what they're doing. So I, you know, find what are, what are they doing right on their balcony? And there was consistent things that they all had. Like they all had a little dustpan and brush on the balcony. They all had an activity they do on the balcony. They had a little radio, you know, the old bloke with the radio or um, a newspaper or something. And so I'm always looking for the patterns that underlie what makes things work. Mm. The underlying patterns. And I noticed all these people with great balconies also had really lovely kitchen sinks. Wow. Things were washed, dried, put away, little vase of flowers, things were matching. So I'd take a photo of their balcony and then I'd start taking photos of their sinks. And I soon learned, yep, there's an underlying pattern here too. So that inspired me when I'd go back home to Melbourne to, you know, do what, do what they're doing in the share houses that I ran. So that's something else I've been doing all my life is um, putting together share houses because houses are gardens of people, companion planted, to get along well and bring out the best of each other. Mm. And so I've also been on a mission um, thinking, I want to make a lifestyle that's so good that the richest people want to adopt it and the poorest people can adopt it. Oh, I love that. So that it's good and it, and it really works. So the share houses I make are very low eco footprint, low rubbish, 
they've usually been near a city so you can walk. Um, at the moment, I'm out in the suburbs having a interlude, suburban interlude, never done that in my adult life. Um, but share, um, shared houses are really easy in the city. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so you're doing incredible stuff and I definitely want to come back to this kitchen sink stuff as well as come back to the edible gardens because I think that at the moment, um, I mean, I did earlier, I did last year an interview an interview on um, sustainable agriculture um, and mm -hmm. it grows and we talked a lot about um, edible gardens and he was doing a survey at the, at the moment because a lot of people in in you know, when COVID hit last year, were starting to do a lot of planting at home. So I think that that's still something that a lot of people are interested in when they, especially if they've got smaller spaces, in how to do that. So I'd love to come back to some of that. But before we do that, how do you, um, one other thing that, that you do is combine not only the permaculture design, but you also combine the Zen or the Japanese culture. So how does that fit in? And what is that? <laughs> oh, it's, it's like hand in a glove. Because permaculture really comes from Japanese culture. And Bill Mollison was a big fan of Masanobu Fukuoka and other nature-inspired Japanese farmers. Uh, the Japanese are masters of making a lot out of a little. And they've always been famed for, you know, tiny little Walkmans. How did they get so much into so little? And that's another goal of permaculture, maximum uh, productivity, minimum space. Use the smallest possible bit of land to get the most food. Mm. Stack things high, you know, get it, get it pumping all year. Mm. Uh, and there's so much about Japanese culture that's, reflected in permaculture but most permies don't know it because they haven't spent time in japan for example iterate i love that word i didn't know what it meant when i first read it in bill mollen's book he said mollison's book he said permaculture is an iterative process what's iteration but it means you do something you yep. make it you put it out in the world you see how it goes and then you refine it and you make it better and you make it better so you don't do a permaculture design like you see a garden, pen and paper, there you go, make this. No, that's not permaculture. That's like consumer item. You'll maybe make a list of here are the first things you do in the first six months. Do those and we'll see how it goes. I think in the end you're going to have a big tree here and something here, but let's start and see. So that put it out into the world and see is why permaculture designs are great. Mm. And the Japanese are a highly iterated culture. They've been developing themselves for centuries, trying things, seeing what works, and standardizing. Like, for example, kimono is one basic design, it's just one shape. Mm. And it doesn't go out of date, like, it's the same shape as it's been for hundreds of years. It's really modular and simple. And you can un unpick it and make it fit a big person or a small person. This is very flexible. Mm. Oh. And that's something their culture worked out over centuries. So it's working out in many goes how to make life great. Australia is a very young country. We haven't iterated much. We haven't developed much new stuff. We don't have to because we're so rich. There are so many resources which we, we squander terribly. Uh, my, my houses, um, I, I've I had lots of people living in my, my space, but I make it feel very spacious and I learnt these tricks from Japan so people don't feel confined or constrained. And, you know, they're so happy to be in this house and they you know, pay premium to be there. So uh, some of them and others are, are there for free because they're volunteers or woofers. So it all works out that, you know, in one house, there's an ecosystem of different 
creatures and they're all happy with, with what they've got. And I've learned that from Japanese culture, how to take away what's not really useful and only keep what's really useful. This is such a refined culture. Now I'm talking here about the cultivated culture, not the popular culture, because poor popular, popular, um, like commercial culture, you know, that's pretty, pretty tough. Japanese are number 80 on the World Happiness Index. They work really hard. In a way, they're kind of being exploited by the system. Yeah. But the culture I'm talking about is the traditional culture you find in Aikido or tea ceremony or architecture or farming. Yeah. The, the, the traditions. Okay, so... Um... Thank you. That's like definitely, um, you know, definitely makes it a lot clearer and can picture a whole lot more and understand where you're getting a lot of the principles from. I mean, it sounds also like to me like a really, like very much parallel to a scientific process really, isn't it? Where you put in, you try one thing, you test it, you look at it, and then you draw some conclusions and then you, you know, you go, oh no, we could try it this way and then you try that and then it keeps getting refined over time until you have you know the best possible solution so in a way it kind of is similar to a scientific process it's um, completely scientific and bill's quite strict about that bill mollison he says don't teach something unless you're doing it yourself yeah don't take anything on faith he says use observation yeah he says you've got to write the book of gardening from your garden you can't say, oh, the, the book, the companion planting book says that um, this and that go together, so I'll plant them. No, that's not scientific. That's religion. That's faith. That's yes. obedience. It's not permaculture. You work out, well, why are, they, why, why are they good companions? And you might find out, well, this attracts a butterfly that eats the pests off that. But in my region, we don't have that butterfly. So that was meaningless. And you might experiment with your own good companion plants and you will be furthering human knowledge and getting a really good garden. So it's very much about being experimental and scientific. Yes, absolutely. So bef what, just, just before we said that, where you mentioned um, with the Japanese culture, how you sort of get rid of all the things or they, you know, simplify to, um, I suppose, in a way, get rid of the things that they're, that aren't useful or that they're, the resources that aren't useful. So let's, from that point, move on to some of the things with the house and decluttering. Because when I think of that and I think of my home or the way that, you know, the resistance I have with some decluttering, mm. I, or some of the more conventional ways of decluttering, it causes me um, emotional overwhelm where I go, yes, that resource is not being used at the moment, but I don't want to get rid of it because I might use it down the track and I don't want to waste and have to buy it something again because I would have had it otherwise or if it's a piece of clothing um, you know things come back into fashion or I might not fit into this now but I might fit into it later <laughs> or my child might want it and it's a bit sentimental or you know like how do we how do we rehome things without necessarily letting go of them and how do we decide what to let go of and what to keep Yes. When I turn up at someone's house, they're often frightened. They've been frightened in the past and some have hired professional declutterers and had an awful time. It's been really unpleasant, stressful, heartbreaking and regretful. And the professional declutterers made them get rid of things that they wish they hadn't. So in permaculture, you go with, not against the creature. You go with, not against nature, including human nature. Um, my system's so different because I do something really inspiring at the beginning um, that makes it so easy to just let go of what you should let go of and to hold what you should be keeping. So I do what I call the postcard method and I get people to get their phones and we go around and we take photos, close-ups 
of 10 beautiful combinations in the house that they love and they're proud of. And we look at them together and we find a theme. And we'll, we may find, wow, your style is sweet pea caramel. You've got all these brown 70s furniture and then you've got all these bright, um, pretty colours. And that's your style. Let's expand that. And then we take 10 anti-postcards and they go around and they take photos of stuff, sites that they just don't know why they're in the house, like some ripped open breakfast cereal package, coloured tangle of cords. And, and they say, why do I live with this? And they just look at it and suddenly they just want less of that. So from their hearts, about 20 minutes into me being in the house, they've got a vision of how they want their house. So you just expand what's working and what's not working naturally shrinks. So, and I made that method up just thinking of what Bill said, observation solves most problems. And people aren't able to really see what's happening in the house because just visual fatigue it on a screen changes everything so that's one thing I do that's quite powerful we you know we'll make a word and people will say wow I'm like a bubbly pink bubblegum kind of lady and I like jolly pink plastic things and you know cartoon like things let's get rid of these you know hairy fuzzy unglazed pottery and someone else will say the opposite. Wow, I'm a granola kind of person. I like crunchy, unglazed, natural concrete and grey with curlicues of golden calligraphy and um, old Moroccan curly things on kind of industrial. So, you know, we said that your curl golden curlicues on industrial. And she's so happy. Like when you name someone's style, they're thrilled. And then they, they look at objects in their house and say, no, not my style. No, not me. And they don't feel obliged. Just because I paid money, I have to keep it. That drops away. Mm. So I'm, I'm very proud of this like, system I've got. And then I've got a few other permaculture um, patterns that I tell them go straight to their heart. They're convinced in a, in, you know, a couple of minutes. One is reduce useless diversity and increase useful diversity. So, for example, you want diversity of people to eat dinner with. You want dinner parties and people coming over. You want to not be scared of cooking. But you might want diversity of pot plants or diversity of other things. You do not need diversity of Tupperware and Tupperware lids. <laughs> you know that thing where, yeah, you, you spend 10 minutes trying to find a lid that fits the Tupperware? No. Let's just make one family of Tupperware, you know, standardise, one size. So they get that. Yeah, reduce useless diversity. Like I've got, you know, five different um, can openers. I really only need one. Yeah. I could keep a backup in case that one fails. Let's pick the one that I find beautiful and inspiring. And there's also minimum viable product. Use the smallest and simplest of anything. So the big clunky can opener, you know, ergonomically designed, takes up heaps of space. You can donate that. And just the simple, tiniest, littlest one with the least features is probably going to be the one that will last the longest. A lot of people have a can opener from the 70s. Mm. It works great. Yes. Just those metal ones. Yes, yes. Wow. Actually, in some houses, I've, I've, I've asked someone and said, do you have cans that need a can opener? And they've said, oh, no, because everything has a ring pull now. I said, maybe you don't even need it. But we've, we've, and we've kept the can opener in a zone two. So there's, here's something else I do. I teach people permaculture zones and it's so powerful. So in permaculture, there's the idea of zone one to five. Zone one are things you plant right next to your back door that you're going to use a lot. 
like strawberries or coriander because if you don't get right onto it the birds will or it'll be come and gone before you know it or things that need a lot of water or love or protection things you use a bit less or a bit further your pumpkins are even further um, your pecan trees are even further and furthest to zone five nature where you don't go just for nature and homes have zones too. So the zone one is where your hand and eye naturally fall. And that's your kitchen sink, your bench, your dining table. And that should always be current, like a fresh river. It's not for storage. So I inspire people to keep that clear. And clear doesn't mean empty. So we'll take... The, we'll take the, um, the drying rack off the sink and put it under the sink. And people don't believe that they're gonna like this. They think it's not possible. And 95% people really fall in love with no rack because no rack means you dry as soon as you've washed and you put it away. And that kind of creates a vacuum so that the next dirty thing, you just wash it and put it away. You have guard flowers on your sink because in permaculture, nature, nature abhors a vacuum, they say. Bare soil is unhappy soil. If you take out a weed, you've got to plant something useful or the weeds will come back. So we beautify our kitchen sink. We put some guard flowers, like a guard dog, and the flowers tell everyone this is no longer a sink. It's a shrine of beauty and love. You do not dump your veggie mite butter knife there. No, it's a beautiful place of beauty. And once you set that culture in the sink, people get with the program. Mm. And I teach people, you know, if they're really overwhelmed, they say, all we're gonna do is make your sink beautiful. And that will set the culture of the house and the edges may bit by bit expand. Your kitchen will inspire you every day, just your sink. And you'll start to use those patterns that you learned in your sink, you'll use them in other areas reduce useless diversity, increase useful diversity. Mm. Beautify, don't tidy. Yes. So mm. I'm probably better at tidying. <laughs> yeah, don't tidy. Tidy's horrible. Um, yeah. But so that reminded me when you just said mm. about um, you know, instead of moving something to another spot, just get kind of rid of it. And there's sort of that flow of like you know, when you just described washing a dish and then putting it away as opposed to having the middle step it on the rack. So mm -hmm. that made me think about my office. So that's probably yeah. a really good place to go to next because I think a lot oh, of people yeah. are working at home. And the reason mm. I thought about my office is because forget work-related stuff, just even on house admin-related stuff. And I think this mm -hmm. is a trait I've found, and I'm, this isn't concrete or scientifically proven, but from mm -hmm. conversations with friends, this seems to be a more female thing to do than a male thing to do. But yeah. I tend to pay a bill and, mm. and instead of from that right paid on it, and yeah. then for, instead of from there it going straight to the filing cabinet, I have a mm. tray that says paid. <laughs> or a tray that says to file mm, <laughs> so that mm, little mm. step of instead of and and it feels at the time something that's mm. quicker and more mm. efficient but it ends up being um if if i'm just looking to the side then um it was because i'm looking at this big pile on top of the filing cabinet that is still yet to be filed <laughs> And so um, it ends up being obviously creates more clutter. So that's why I just thought about the office. <laughs> you just said that. Yeah, let's move to the office. Let's let's go go to the office. Let's go to the office. So, what so as a permaculture designer, you'd say I have a design problem. I'm double, triple handling this piece of paper. How can we design for this to be easier? Hmm. So the first thing you try and do is eliminate, like, do, do you need to keep that bill? Isn't there a record of it in your bank? Oh, some things I think for tax purposes, you've got to keep for seven years. Okay, so you can take a photo mm. of it. Mm. So I take a photos of lots of things, everything, even 
I take a photo of my car if I have to go to a like a shopping centre because there's no way I'll remember where I parked it. I suppose the problem with that that I first foresee mm. in my mm. world is yeah. that one of my other really terrible cluttered spaces, yeah, which is not very organised, is my mm. computer. <laughs> so I tend to then, when I've got a whole lot of digital files, they're not neatly... Um, they begin neatly, it's, you know, that mm. I have the intention to begin them in neat folders mm. and subfolders and they start that way. But then with the overwhelm coming in, they end up being um, a whole lot of things on my desktop files yeah. and then a whole lot of just saved into documents. So, mm. the, and same with the photos. So if I took a photo, that's all really good. But if I'm taking a whole lot of photos, oh shit, their photos aren't categorized. So how am I going to find that photo? Ah, cause I use Google photos. So all you have to do is type in like cat and every photo of a cat will appear or bill and all the photos of bills will appear, but oh. it's not, it's not fail, fail proof. Bills you don't need to keep. Receipts you do. Bills you, I don't think you need to keep because mm. it's... But anyway, I do have a system for papers that's really easy and it's about putting things in families. And I don't have file... My clients can get rid of whole, like, whole walls of folders, get turned into something they can carry. And I learned it from Japan. And it's, it's very, very simple. I get people to buy like 300 of clear plastic folders that are open on two sides. They're like sleeves. Yes. And with removable stickers, they put the, the name of the family that's inside. So things are all in families in, in a Cecilia designed house. So it could be, so a, your bill family or your medical records family. And they're not in covers and they're very easy to open and access. And you, you can see from the outside what's in them. And the families have their own house. So I've got them in clear A4 boxes from Muji, the Japanese home goods store. Um, and one box is like officialdom and another box is inspirational ideas and another box is museum of my wonderful projects so every house needs museums you need museum of my past clothes or costumes um, and you know you paid money for the box i get it, i get everyone to get standard storage boxes the 52 liter tubs the good ones from office works clear and it, it goes in the family and you make the family beautiful. It's not an ugly folder with clips you've got to wrestle and you can't see what's in it. All storage should be as clear as possible. So at a glance, you know what's in it. Uh, um, it should be labelled so you don't have to think, what's this? It, it, it says. And your labels can be whatever your interests are. So I've got a folder called bunny and I've got a folder called um, personality types, tests. And they just go in a big box called creative life. And I can just pull them all out and go through the folders and get what I need. Mm. And all in one. Yeah, so my, the homes are lovely, so it makes it easy, but I'm pretty... So I, I do decluttering for people with better things to do than housework and better things to do than filing. So it's good if it can go to its home straight away. Things that files that need to have things put in them often are on top, so in zone two, so it's easy to get to. And folders you don't put things in often are maybe zone three. You just put things in at Christmas time and they're further at a different shelf. So the things you need often should be close to you physically so maybe your bill folder should be not too far away and then you don't have to have the out tray. Yes. So you probably had a proximity problem. Probably wasn't easy to get to your filing cabinet or it wasn't beautiful or inviting. So we make it inviting so you want to do it. Yeah. The things you should do, design them to be the things you want to do. Yeah, that's good. And keep, yeah. and keep your zone one always flowing. 
So you zone one your desk, it's things, no storage. Things have to be in motion or that or stagnation sets in. Yes, and I suppose Current, the same tip you gave around the kitchen sink. So unless it's flowing and it's less it's usable and flowing all the time, then um, like the kitchen sink, your desk sort of sits like that as well. So it's your river. <laughs> Exactly, yes, and it should be fresh and inspiring and it will bring life to your world. Uh, so a tray called out tray yes. can be handy. I do something that I've made up is so useful and it's called bus stops. And here's an idea that might help you yes. and people with children think how did I live without it so I get trays like with two handles and I put them near the door and things that don't live in this room but I don't want to stand up and go to the other room and put it away and get distracted and get off task it goes in the bus stop and then when I'm going that way I take the whole bus stop with me and I put all the things you know that the cup of tea is meant to go in the kitchen so when I'm going that way I bring it for children it's amazing Mummy, mummy, can I, can I do the bus run now? No, you've got to wait. They just want to tidy up if you put things in the bus stops. Oh, so that's okay. very helpful. So, yeah, I've kind of got a bus, stop, a bus stop basket in the laundry for each child so that when, the, when I've done the washing and folded the clothes, they're, it's in their bus stop basket, I suppose. My, my well, thing is, is that that basket, that getting the kids because they're not kids and they're not such kids anymore and they're teenagers to get them to take that bus stop basket to their bedrooms to oh, yeah. it is not so easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because they're not already in the laundry. So while you're there and it's in your hand, it might be the time to put it in front of their bedroom door because mm. they're not there and you are. Mm. Um, so, you know, because a household's a team, there's a rule or guideline that you know team us has to be the winner if it's easier for you to bring it to their door that's what you do and other things it's easier for them to bring to you so they should be doing that like mm -hmm. whoever's standing up gets the tomato sauce but whoever's sitting down yes yeah because they're already onto it and yes. if something's in your hand that's the best time to deal with it the Japanese, oh, they freak me out. They're so fantastic. So I'd have these Japanese housemates and I'd watch them cook. And after they'd finished cooking and eating, they wash one plate, two chopsticks and a cup. They sit down to a perfectly clean kitchen. And as an Aussie, I'd experience having a wonderful meal and then you're all drunk and happy and you turn around and there is a horror film in your kitchen. The Japanese clean as they cook. And they say, yeah, like the pan, like it's in your hand already and you put the food on the plate and while it's hot and wet, you just go like that and it's easy. But if you let it cool down, the food sticks to it and it's really hard to wash. And it's like you pay interest on the tasks that you don't do straight away. So. If you really like housework, put your tasks off till later. Yes, but if you don't, if you don't do want them to spend your life doing housework, yeah, you do them straight away. Yeah. Wow, that was a revelation. You just start cooking five minutes earlier and tidy as you go, and then the kitchen's all clean when you're eating. So nice. Yes. And one reason I really got into permaculture for inside your home is we're so mean to our future selves. Our current self says, yeah, I'm going to have fun and do what I want to do. And then your future self has a horrible cleanup. Mm. It's life is so beautiful when you're sweet to your future self. Oh, oh I'll watch this now and future Cecilia will be so happy. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great reframe, isn't it? That's a great way yeah. to do the mindset. Is like, yeah, let's, mm. let's take the load off for the future self. Yeah, because you've already got it in your hand or it's already there. Do yeah. it and surprise her. And that mm. could be a really good segue into talking about edible gardens because by planting mm -hmm. edible gardens in your home, that is being really nice for your future self. 
because <laughs> we'll have all that food. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So talk me through some stuff and some tips around edible gardens because, you know, it is, there are some people who will naturally plant things in their homes and then, there, then there's most people who through conditioning, especially in the Western world, will not plant things in their home and will rather go down the street and buy them. Now, mm -hmm. Obviously, the, I think the, the entry point for a lot of people is herbs. But at the same time, in my experience, mm -hmm. a lot of the herbs that we use on a daily basis, so a lot of people might use basil, coriander, parsley, say, mm -hmm. are also quite hard to maintain. Like, they, you think you've got it, you think they're good and they're growing really well and then they die and, you know, it's, mm. it's quite hard and then they're not that cheap either just to buy. So you just think, oh, stuff it. This is just dying and dying. Mm. I don't have enough anyway for, the, for how much I want to use for cooking and I'm going to just go and buy it. So what tips can you give to actually allow people to feel like this is worth it? Yeah, the garden has to serve you more than you serve it. And for most people, it doesn't work out that way. It's That's so sad. Mm. Yeah. Um, the, first, the first thing I do is I really enjoy fluffing up the soil. So I get the soil really great. And that's so much fun. So I'll get my pick and I'll, if it's clay, I'll, I'll dig it up once. I'll go to the local cafe, make friends and keep getting their coffee grounds and putting it in. And I'd have a worm farm going. I'll go to the farmer's market and get the leftover lettuce leaves, chop them little, um, get the compost going. So make the soil yummy and then things go well. If your soil's not good, nothing will go right. And that's the basics of permaculture. Get the groundwork right and everything else will go right by itself. Mm. Even for homes. I think that's, I the, see that's the basis of life, isn't it? Get the foundations good. And yeah. whether it be the building, whether it be your, you know, for your own personal health, for your business, for, you know, get the core foundations right and everything else on will flow better. Yeah, or if all these unexpected things will go right by themselves that you didn't even plan for. Yes. And that's why I'm in love with decluttering. Um, I'll go into homes and it's just, I'll, like I, I, early on I did, um, I was looking after some depressed people and in their house after a few hours, I felt like I was moving through honey because nothing worked. Like I'd try, I'd um, try cooking for them. Um, the knife was blunt. I couldn't cut the onions. I was cutting myself. The cutting board was wobbly. It was mouldy on one side. The, I, I didn't know which cupboard things were in. Plates were here and here and there. I'd fail and fail and fail and fail. And by the time I'd made the lasagna, I'd failed 200 times. Mm. That's enough and, to be depressed. <laughs> yeah. Even just talking about it. Those poor people. Yeah. And, you know, they're on medication when just set, well, not, you know, there's multiple factors and multiple things, sure. but the, the psychologist should have, you know, at least asked for a photo of their house. Any, put any sane person or, you know, well, doing well person in that house and they'll, they'll struggle. Mm. And it's so kind of cruel that our culture isn't helping them. And we're leaving them on their own or just with medication or making them feel that they're failing when their environment's just not, not helping them. Mm. Anyway, so getting the basics right, mm. you know, one is getting the house right or getting the soil right if it's a garden. And then the plants can heal their own diseases. And, you know, when a pest comes, the plant's able to manufacture its own chemical defences to manage the pest because there's lots of ingredients in the, in the soil. They've got all the um, calcium or um, phosphate or whatever it is they need to manufacture 
you know, their defense systems. So step number one is getting the soil right. Problem is a lot of people don't see there's a direct benefit to them of having fluffy soil. But I think you've got to use your imagination and you might say, I'm doing yoga for my soil. It is now strong and flexible and hydrated. The soil is me and I'm the soil. Since the soil's doing so well, it's flexible and it's got air pockets. How about I look after my body too? Let's go and do some yoga and get flexible, get hydrated. Um, you know, we learn in spirituality, we are one, the earth and I are one. Well, use your imagination. You really are. And the more you can look after your little patch of garden, the more you remember to look after yourself, mm. I think. Yeah. So Because I'm using my imagination. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of people that if you, you know, if you happen to be listening to this um, conversation, if you can't think of it in spiritual terms, even just put it in the parallel, you know, just a parallel between looking, you know, what lessons are we learning from the nat from nature that we can implement in our everyday life. And I mean, you can do that so well through so many, whether it be looking at nature, whether, you know, I've done an episode before with an artist and looking at, you know, like a painting on a canvas and how that parallels with our personal development and our life. So I think that, yeah, whatever activity we're doing, it can always parallel, well, this is benefiting this. How we, how can I transfer that into my everyday life as well to benefit me and my wellbeing? Such a good, such a good point, Lisa. I hadn't thought of that. But every time you're meant to be gardening, if you don't feel like it, you can say, all right, I'm going to go gardening. Let's see if I can find a parallel that will help me in my personal life from the next 10 minutes I spend in the garden. And you look for the lesson. You say, okay, garden, you're going to be my sensor. I'm going to learn something from you in the next 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So even if it did feel a bit like unpaid labor, you've got a really precious lesson. That mm -hmm. is a generative way of looking at it. What's the parallel? Yes. Yeah. All right. So next step, have we got a next step with the... Yeah. All right. Next step is you get a lovely chair and table and you plonk it near where you're going to grow your vegetables and you try and get dapples somehow so the sun filters in and you're not in direct sun or direct shade so you make it a convivial place you want to drink your coffee or write your diary or do something because your presence will make this garden loved and interesting and interested and good for you then i'd say um, get a, a bucket of water or a barrel, put your, put your cold shower water in it so that there's always water on hand or a hose. Um, I used to have always on my balcony gardens a, a pond and it might even be a squeezy pink bucket with, you know, fish and water plants in it because you don't have to remember to water a water plant because it's already a pond. So a little mobile pond is a great thing to have in your tiny little, and start with a one metre garden. Start small and successful. Mm -hmm. I definitely plant flowers. I always plant cosmos and pansy, um, viola, the little pansies, the tiny ones, because they spread like crazy, the little purple like pansies, and you can eat them. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty, yeah. and they encourage you. So you have flowers to thank you and vegetables to feed you. Hmm. Edibles and beautifuls. I try and have half, half. So that your garden is very pretty and it's your artwork and it's your colors and it's the shape of leaves you like. I don't like spiky things. So I, I like round leaves. So I plant a lot of round leaf things. I love the, I love the waviness of rhubarb. I actually don't eat rhubarb, but I love the colour, I love the waviness, and I'll grow it and I'll give it to the old lady down the street and she'll give me something else. It works really well. So usually I recommend plant things you want to eat or look at. So cosmos is a beautiful flower. It's the typical flower flower with the long petals and you just scatter the seeds and it always succeeds and it's got beautiful feathery leaves. And it's just so great. And they're all different levels. So, and they, they flower over months. So they're just, 
like three dollars for a packet of success and you have flowers for months yeah so i think so they might be favorites so i think the lesson here is is for people that don't do anything yet to start yeah. small and succeed so that you don't have that so it stops that like because if you fail really quickly you give up really quickly so start yeah. with something that's simple and succeed and therefore from that place it will hopefully motivate further to do more exactly so your main crop should be a gardener you are growing a gardener so if you set yourself up for failure and you're heartbroken you won't garden again that's really bad so you've got to plant things that will let you succeed and think i'm good at this mm. so cosmos and pansies and even you know the 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 little trays of seedling violas from bunnings you know that they usually do well if you're scared of doing seed but cosmos seed always succeeds Mm. plant things that pests won't go for in your first year so if you if if you've got nothing there and your neighbors are all using then all the pests will come straight to you um mm. so some things like um broccoli will get the the caterpillar moths you might, you might be a bit discouraged and there's ways to manage it, but you do not want to be going and spraying with natural pest spray. Don't, don't do that. Mm. Personally, I, I, I have, exp I have done things like plant broccoli in tubs. And then when it's early spring and there's that but white butterfly, I just bring them inside mm. for a couple of weeks and I put them outside again because the pests aren't there all year. So what's an easy vegetable to, for someone to start Silver on? beet. Silver beet is fantastic and it's food. I, I don't really recommend growing herbs because they're not food and you can't, they're just decoration. Why? Parsley is real food. Yeah, I mean, I cook with herbs, so I use them as food. Um, Actually, now that I say that, I plant a lot of Japanese herbs. Yeah. All right. I can't, I, all right, I cancel that. Cancel what I said. <laughs> Basically, I, I'm just not into basil. Fair enough. Basil's so hard to keep alive in my experience. Well, um, it comes and goes, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose the leafy vegetables is what you're saying is easier, so like the silver beet or the lettuce or things like lettuce is a bit hard actually because if you let it go dry once it doesn't forgive you it goes bitter mm. um i found silver beet a lot more forgiving depends what you've got like in my sydney back garden i had chickens and possums and so i planted things that were not going to fall victim to those forces Mm. My favourite was sweet potato leaf, and it's a sweet potato that you eat the leaf. And all my housemates are just cut from it every day. It would just grow back, and it was never-ending source of deliciousness. But Melbourne's a bit colder, and it's more of a tropical thing. So I, I haven't really succeeded in that. Mm. But it's if once I find the one, that's what I'll do. Right now, I'm planting Japanese edible gardens because I want to have something that you just can't go to the shop and get. Um, so shiso is a Japanese herb and you just get armfuls of it in the summer and you boil it and it's this brown liquid. You add sugar and it's just a sweet brown liquid and then you add lemon juice and it goes crimson and it tastes like this nothing else in the planet it's so special and it's really easy and then it grows from seed the next year it's irrepressible but it's not a weed like it's just not there for half the year so good she's so um i'm planting japanese gardens for my friends at balcony gardens now that i've, I've just returned to melbourne and it's a way to get to make friends with people let's make a japanese edible garden um, I plant spring chrysanthemum. It's um, 
an edible chrysanthemum and you just, it's a green and you put it in your hot pot and it's always yummy and you just pick it every, you know, few days or you have it with sesame sauce. Unusual things, the pests often don't know what to do with them. Mm. So it's good to plant unusual things. Yeah. Um, ah, so, so greens are great. Rocket's really good. Pests don't worry about rocket and it's very forgiving. So I really recommend rocket. Um, yeah, I, I love rhubarb and I actually love um, broccoli because the leaves are so beautiful. It often doesn't get a big head like in the supermarket. Um, but because it's so pretty, I, I just keep forgiving it. Uh, I love persimmons. I always plant a persimmon tree wherever I go because they're just so fantastic. And I, I plant the astringent one and I dry them. Aussies don't know. You peel them and hang them on string from your, your eaves and it looks like Christmas with all these orange baubles. And they dry and they're this most amazing cinnamony, chewy, oh, it tastes like heaven. And that's a culture I, I want to get started. Oh. I did a declutter road show in Castle, Maine in, in the autumn. And this beautiful lady runs the Northern Arts Hotel. She, she just let us stay for free for like three nights. And she had parties every night and she had all these bitter persimmons in a bowl and we showed her how to do it. And we hung them in the window at the front of the hotel. She was so happy. That, that was a really nice cultural exchange. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've given us really good ideas of things that we can do in the um, in our gardens. So little tips that we can use maybe to just get started. And I love the idea of just starting small. And I think that's the way to go when we create any new habit. So we've got that as a tip and I'm sure you've got a load of, um, of knowledge when it comes to really setting up the gardens really well um, in a way that are really usable. And I'm sure if anybody got in touch with you, they could further gain more knowledge in that area. And I'll definitely put all your details on the show notes. And you've talked a little bit about the office space and things that we can do in there and the kitchen and the kitchen sink. Um, and I think the whole idea of working with our own natural flow, the things that came to me were about working with your own natural flow, being beautifying spaces that, um, that align with the individual's idea of beauty and fun. So it makes it appealing. Um, as well as the natural flow of surfaces so that they're like a river and that they that anything that you're using every single day has things on it that are not permanent but movable. So they're the sort of tips that I've gained from some of the things you've said. Um, so if we're looking at in general, inside, outside the home, but in our own homes, but you know, in our outside areas and inside areas, if, we're, if people are looking to create an environment that provides them with the motivation and positivity and direction and clarity and a sense of freedom, what other tips that I didn't summarise there or that we may not have spoken, is there anything else that you want to add that helps people achieve that mission? You're such a good summariser. That's exactly all the things that I said. So yes, think about zones. So there's the flowing zone that doesn't have storage and there's storage zones. And the things you use often, keep them closer to you and make your environment lovable and look like you. So your child, is, your home is also your child and it should resemble you and, and it should help you aspire to your dreams. Um, some other just little useful tips. Um, it's handy is a sign that whatever you have, you don't love and you don't really need. The question is, is it indispensable? Without this object, would my quality of life be less? And the answer is often no. Um, another really useful tip is um, protect creative void. Empty space is something of itself 
like a forest isn't nothing and unowned it's it's its own thing and the empty space on your desk um, it wants to stay empty so that you can be creative there so go around and look at like the white space on a page and say yep I'm protecting that and also the empty space in your house and try and look after it and let it be there for you to do stuff in in Japanese there's five elements earth air fire water and void and void is the most powerful mm. so that's another thought um, do things with other people what you mentioned about the garden so important um, have allies for what you want to do and make um, if you find you're not cooking as often as you want maybe you should be inviting a neighbor over and going and eating at their place um, or invite your sister over if you're scared you're going to let your plants die ask your friends for cuttings and then because it's from your friend they'll feel so much more valuable and you'll want to give them more love because mm. you love your friend and someone else is emotionally involved in your garden now and they'll be saying how are those um, cuttings going those raspberry cuttings and you'll be able to give maybe a good answer set yourself up for success is so important um, write a love letter to your house it starts house I love you and remember your house wants to serve you and wants to make your life beautiful and just acknowledge you and your house are in a relationship and wants to make your life good and just thank it for all the things it's done right and go down memory lane with your house remember the time I sat on the veranda and and the, the moonlight was filtering through I have such a good memory of being with you then house and you might want to apologize to it for a few things gee house I'm really sorry about the vacuum cupboard that is a horrible place you must hate it too one day you and me we're gonna make that beautiful oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, love it. I love it um you know it's it's it sounds silly and I'm sure you know quite wacky I suppose to some people that might be listening but it mm. it feels so fun you know and that's the whole thing it's yeah. creative and silliness is putting a smile puts a smile on our face and whether it fe whether it feels like oh my god like you know you can you know whether some people might feel cringeworthy around mm. that it doesn't really matter because in the end, what's our purpose? Our purpose is to feel more joy and have a better time in our life. And so yes. regardless of whether something feels like, oh my God, that's, that's, that's ridiculous or that's crazy or that's just completely wacko. It doesn't like, you know, maybe just pause for a minute and think, yeah, well maybe it is, but does it, make me smile more or bring bring me more fun and if the answer to that is yes then I think it's a good thing <laughs> yeah exactly right so if you're scared of decluttering you're probably going to do a bad job which is why people are like putting on the accelerator and the brakes at the same time when they declutter so bring a friend over do one of my webinars I have frequent webinars and many of them are giftivist so finances aren't an obstacle because giftivist is a great way to go i've found and some are paid um ask your friends to help you declutter they may end up being a semi-professional declutterer my dream is there's someone like me in every street in australia yes because we need it and I love doing declutter i am in the zone i know exactly what to do and it's not like that when I'm doing other things like, I don't know, taxes. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got our zones of genius, don't we? Yeah. And, and neither cluttering or taxes are mine. Um, I'll, stick to the, I'll stick to the interviewing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, you've given us so many really good tips there. And like you said, you do have um, webinars. Some of them are free and some of them are paid and um i will put your details on the show notes so that people can find you if they're interested to know what webinars are coming up are they all on your website 
sorry. They're all on my Eventbrite site. Um, there's a link to my website. There's, it's also, um, I will be having live events once that's allowed, but that could be a while away. Yes. Um, you can hire Cecilia. Yes. I come to people's houses. I'll, 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 I'll hire you. I think I need, <laughs> I think I need to hire you. Um, so much fun. So it really is. So if somebody wanted to find out more about your services, they would go straight to your website? Yeah, Google Cecilia McCauley or even Cecilia Permaculture will get you there. Fantastic. So I'll put all of that on the show notes. But what I do probably want to finish up with is asking you, based on the idea that you were saying that, you know, you would love for there to be a, um, a person like you in every street, as well as different people having different zones of genius. As so, you know, you really shown me through this conversation, how much you value community and value connection. So can you tell everyone, including me, what you, what your definition of connection is? And we'll finish up. <laughs> oh, connection's my favourite thing. Mm. I think for me, connection's about companion planting of humans. Some people do so much better when they're with each other. And some people shouldn't be together. We should be far apart. So it's picking people you're going to do well with and creating stuff together. Like just talking is not a good reason to be together. Ah, let's meet for coffee. No, do something together. Declutter or bottle tomatoes. So have a creative action. And the conversations you have with people when you're doing something is such a higher level than if you're just gossiping. So make stuff. Um, connection connection is what makes life sparky I fortunately have so many weak points and they're so bad that I've set up my life so I always have volunteers living with me and helping me and I've been a woof host willing workers on organic farm for like 20 years so I've always had people helping me and this feeling of I can't believe I'm so lucky this person is helping with my taxes ask people for help and offer help most of us hate asking and we're shy to offer so if you cook too many cookies just give them to your neighbor mm. um, and be be generous it it um you know get extra chickens and you'll have too many eggs and just always be giving them to your neighbors yeah Mm. Oh, beautiful. And I think, you know, for me, for me, I, um, I think that I could probably, like most people, do more of, do more of that gifting economy. And, you know, I like to think that I do some of that and I do, but I can definitely improve in those areas. And I'm sure most people, um, especially living in the Western world or living in cities, um, could definitely say that they can improve in that area and really create more community and more connection. And I think at this point in time, when we're stuck in our houses and we feel isolated, we have to think of ways that we can bring more community and connection into our lives. And, um, and we just have to get creative in ways that we can do that. Yes, and for me, having my giftivist webinars was a really good way. So people did donate, but they decided the amount. So it wasn't a free webinar, but everyone was different in what they got from it and they wouldn't be scared to join in. And, you know, I'd be telling them, invite your friends. Yes. You know, and, and do it together so you're all learning. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for our conversation and all of your valued contribution today. Lisa, thank you for giving me a stage upon which to dance. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. That was um, yeah. such a nice way of saying it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> dance together on a, sta on a physical stage together soon. <laughs> Whoa, one day. It was great.
Yes. So now over to you, the listeners. I want to know, and Cecilia would like to know, what is your biggest takeaway from today's conversation? If you could leave a comment and let us know, and if you would, as I said, like to connect with Cecilia, I've got all of her details in the show notes below. So just click on her links and um, you can find out more about what she has to offer and her current services. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please share it with your friends and consider subscribing to the Wealthy Living Conversations podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. To find out more about my services, you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au. That's W-E-L-L-T-H-Y.com.au. So until next time, remember, connection is medicine.